It really is a tendency we've got to fight if we're going to carry on thriving and surviving as a human species. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. As new census data shows Britain's demographics have changed at an historic rate, what does a future Britain look like? Is the world over or underpopulated? And how does fertility impact global power struggles? To answer these questions, I'm joined by a leading demographer, Paul Morland. Is the world overpopulated? The world is not overpopulated. It's not overpopulated from the perspective of standing room only. I mean, there's loads and loads of space. Even in a relatively densely populated country like Britain, we are only occupying a relatively small part of the territory in terms of human habitation. Um, it's not over inhabited in terms of the ability of humans to feed themselves. There's been an agricultural revolution. Our food production grows faster than the population and has done for a long time, which is now why we've got plenty of food to feed everybody. Uh, and people are eating much better than ever before, even though there are 8 billion of us. And there are real trends underway in the world where we can see underpopulation as a threat to the future. For example, in Korea, where the average woman, the average couple has perhaps 0 0.7, 0 0.8 children, which means each cohort's going to be a third of the size of the last. I mean, think what that's going to look like if you run that forward for a few generations, or even just two generations, in terms of abandoned villages and even suburbs and cities uh, emptying out effectively. But this idea that the world is overpopulated can be traced back a, a, a long time. You can look at the book The Population Bomb from the 1960s, um, which had a huge impact on this debate. Can you just talk a little bit about that book and, and, and what it said? Well, that book was very much in the tradition of, of Thomas Malthus, which was uh, a book written in the originally in 1798, I think, and then he re republished it and, and the versions changed. But there's a, a long strand of belief that population would grow up to some limit, to some catastrophic, catastrophic limit. And Ehrlich was in that tradition. And when he was writing in the 60s, global population was growing at a little over 2% a year, um, which obviously on a compound basis is phenomenal. And we know he went to India and he was shocked and horrified at people, people everywhere. Um, what's happened since then, of course, is that the fertility rate of the world has fallen. Um, perhaps back then, the average woman globally was having five or six children, obviously much lower in the West. Um, very low fertility has spread from the West to East Asia. Even in India now, the fertility rate is only about two children per woman. Uh, it's much lower than that in China, so some big global players. So the fertility rate of the world has tumbled. The population growth rate of the world has gone from 2% a year to about 1% a year. Everyone can now see it topping off altogether within a few uh, decades, certainly by the end of this century. So I think the population bomb was a bit of a bomb and you know it's full of predictions that did not come to fruition mass starvation hundreds of millions of people dying i mean the only place that millions of people or, or certainly hundreds of thousands died was under incompetent marxist regimes such as in ethiopia um, there has not been the kind of calamity that paul ehrlich forecast and in fact humanity has got fantastically better fed lives much longer has fantastically lower infant mortality despite the growth in numbers and the numbers are slowing. And a more recent or more contemporary, I suppose, um, argument for the world being overpopulated is linked with climate change. And if you speak to many people my age, younger people in the West in particular, they would say it's immoral to have children because this would this could cause um, problems in the future for carbon sort of carbon carbonization and things like this. So can you just assess the impact of that of climate change on fertility? Sure. I mean, I think it's an absolute calamity if young people won't have children for climate reasons, if they want to take fewer flights, uh, if they want to live in smaller houses, if they want to find uh, uh, more fuel efficient ways of moving around the world and heating their houses, good luck to them. But if they stop having children altogether, imagine we all get to the position of Korea where a third, each cohort's a third of the size of the last, and the next one's a third of the size of that. Uh, if we disappear as a species, we won't be emitting any carbon. Uh, but that's not a future that I would welcome. I welcome a world in which humans flourish. I welcome a world in which f humans are getting more and more educated, better and better fed, 
They're having reasonably sized families, and I don't want those family sizes to get too small. But I also believe with uh, Julian Simon, who uh, famously bet against Paul Ehrlich and won, that um, an extra pair of hands, an extra mouth, is also an extra brain. So it's not, don't think about an extra emitter, it's also an extra problem solver. And human genius is fantastic. So many people in the world now are getting a really good education. The vast majority of the world has become literate. That wasn't the case 50, 60 years ago. More and more people are getting a university education. And, so I, and, and of course, scholars are, are networking with, with the uh, World Wide Web and so on. And knowledge is moving forward. So I think we should be optimistic that we can solve these sorts of technical problems and that we can solve them more creatively and in a way that is consonant with human flourishing rather than just saying, aren't we a horrible impact on the climate, let's just cease to exist as a, as a species. I think that would be a terrible catastrophe uh, from, a, from a human and even from a global perspective. Some say it's immoral to have children because they would then have to grow up in this terrible world that we live in with this climate catastrophe that's going to destroy civilization. Yeah. Do you think there's become, there, there is now a taboo, a f sort of f fertility taboo? I think there are two strands to the global warming argument. The, one you, the first one you suggested was my child will contribute to the emissions and I think we've discussed that your child might contribute to the solution. And also that we are emitting less and less uh, by each generation. And the other side of things is the world is so terrible now, who could possibly bring a child into it? And I think that is a absolutely shocking perspective. I was born just after the Cuban Missile Crisis. My parents might have said, oh my goodness, uh, the world's about to be blown up. How can we bring a child into this world? My grandparents, were, my parents were born at the time. My father, the inflation in Germany, he was born there. My mother was born in 1933 when the Nazis had just come to power in Germany. Uh, but, you know, terrible times to be born. My grandparents were born between the eve of the First World War, the youngest, and the terrible financial downturn in Germany after, after the immediate boom post 1870 unification. Uh, so if I look at the history of my own grandparents, my parents and myself, there are fantastically good reasons. You might have said at the time, how can you bring a child into the world? In contrast to their experience, when we now bring a child into the world, such as my daughter, who's just brought a child into the world two weeks ago, and another one who, please God, will be bringing a child into the world in the next week or two, they have fantastically better prospects than any other generation. They will be better educated, they will be better fed. Of course, a calamity might happen, the world might be hit by a meteorite, but I think the opportunities for youngsters being born today are potentially wonderful. Of course, our fate as a, as a human species is in our hands, but to uh, wring our hands at this stage, when so much is so much better, we live longer, infant mortality has tumbled, to say that these are circumstances in which we shouldn't have children, suggests that our ancestors should never have had children, we shouldn't have crawled out of the cave, we probably shouldn't have evolved from apes in the first place, if only we could turn the clock back. And I think that's terribly misanthropic, and it really is a tendency we've got to fight if we're going to carry on thriving and surviving as a human species. Could we actually go extinct as a species? Of course we could go extinct in a number of ways. We could go extinct because of a meteorite. We could go extinct because of a, a nuclear bomb. So we could do, the, but, but I think you're thinking particularly of, of low fertility. I think that's improbable. I think we, certain people, certain countries could get to the point where they aren't really sustainable. I mean, the, the Prime Minister of Japan is already talking about civilizational collapse. Uh, they have massive government debt in Japan, and they're on the cusp of really big populations decl population declines, which we've never seen. So I think that will happen at the country level. Uh, there will be collapses at the country level. I think for humans to go extinct altogether is very unlikely. Um, there is one perspective, which is that there is such a thing as a pronatal gene. And it hasn't been selected for or against in the past because people had children, they had very little control about it. And then when contraception came in, people continued having children because of social pressures. In a world where whether or not you have children becomes a really big issue, it's not just an assumption that you have them then in that kind of world, the pronatal gene might be selected for. And even if it's not a gene, it's a complex of genes, or it's a culture, there are cultures and there are possibly genetic combinations which incline people to have uh, large or at least reasonably sized families. My concern is that individual countries, individual communities are going to be under enormous pressure as they age, 
as their governments need to spend more and more on healthcare, as there's no one to look after their old people, there's no one to uh, look after electricity supply or transport in remote areas. These are the pressures I see happening. I think a final extinction of the human species because we won't breed is very unlikely because I, I think there's whatever the propagandists of environmentalism and, and other, other uh, ideas uh, might, might propagate, uh, I think there will always be a fundamental pronatalism somewhere in the world. So in the past, obviously, certain civilizations have collapsed. Has that been due to fertility problems? And you, I know that you talk about in your book about Italy and Japan as being the two countries which might face this problem. So can you just talk a bit about sort of past civilizations that have faced similar issues? I think there's a lot of talk in the classical world of, oh, were men having enough children and did Rome collapse because of a population, too, too few people. I, I don't think the data's great, number one. Number two, I'm not a classical scholar and my knowledge of demography is really post uh, Malthus. So I'm a bit skeptical because I think the vast majority of people wouldn't have had the means to control their fertility very effectively. We know there were forms of contraception in ancient Egypt but they weren't very effective and most peasants in, in the Roman Empire I imagine just went about their business as, as people always have done. So I'm a bit skeptical that in the past um, low fertility has really driven anything very significant. Um, what has happened in the past is there have been population expansions, such as in the Middle Ages, uh, there were technological advances, ploughs got better, metho me me methods of, of, of draining swamps got better. So Europe expanded. And this was in some ways the classical model which, which Malthus was expressing. But you can see similar things happen in China and then it gets knocked back. Either because it reaches some limit or you get something like the Black Death or you get a terrible war like in the 17th century, the, the Thirty Years' War. So populations can expand and get knocked back, seriously knocked back, knocked back for a very long period of time. But I don't believe historically that has been because people have chosen to have small families. I think this is a new crisis and I think we've got to get our heads around it. There's not really much historical precedent. So let's, let's really sort of break things down to, on the basic level. There's this famous number, 2.1, and that's the fertility rate at which a population needs to sustain mm -hmm. itself. Where does that number come from? Can you just explain what fertility is sure. and what that rate is? So fertility is the average number of children a woman will have in her life, a lifetime. And you can see today how many children did a woman born in 1960 have, 1950, 1970? But there's a, something called a total fertility rate, which just looks at, at it from a, the point of view of a particular point in time. Um, and that gives you more contemporary data. But effectively, if every, first of all, if women are half the population, um, and in China, where they've had selective abortions, and some parts of India, they're not always, they have to have a bit more than two per woman. But if all women had two children, and all those children survived through their fertility, then two would suffice. 2.1 is a bit of a rounding error because not everybody makes it to the age when they can get. Now, if you if they have children of their own, if you go back to um, Roman times or even medieval times or even the 18th century, you needed a lot more than that because a third would die before they were born. Well, but die before they were born. A third would die before they reached the age of one. And the best part of a third would die before they reached fertility themselves. But if you think about it, if the population and that hadn't been the case, and you'd had, the average woman had five or six children, and then the next generation had five or six, you would have had a huge population expansion much earlier than you had it. You only got a population explosion really in Europe and Britain and then the rest of Europe from the beginning of the 19th century when you got the mortality rate down and eventually the infant mortality rate down. So in a world where very few people are gonna die before they're 50, that fortunate world which we were talking about that we exist in, in such a world, two is good enough, just about, and 2.1 maybe to cover the odd um, person who doesn't make it through their fertile years. Um, I think we can get a bit over-obsessed by 2.1 because if it were 1.9, what you'd be building in is very long-term, slight population decline, and I don't think that's a huge problem. I think it becomes a problem when it gets down to 1.5, 1.6, or when a sub-replacement fertility persists for a very long time. Because initially, the population keeps growing. You've got lots of young women, they're not having that many children, the population pyramid is shaped like that. Not that many people are dying because there aren't that many old people. And that was Britain in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. But eventually, that large cohort who's not had many children is the old cohort. Many of them will die. And the population pyramid changes its shape. 
And so finally, we're getting to the point of Britain, we're not quite there yet, where we have more deaths than births each year. Even though we've had 50 years of sub-replacement fertility, what we've been enjoying is something called demographic momentum, whereby just the previous generations having expanded has meant that even at low fertility, the population has kept growing, although aging. Now we're going to get to the point where, as Japan has already, is already getting to, where uh, the population declines. There are more deaths every year than births. That's true in Japan. That's true in Germany topped up by immigration. In Britain, the, the, um, number, the, the, the number of births o over the number of deaths, so the, the net growth, natural growth of the population, is perhaps one-tenth of what it was 30 or 40 years ago. And Scotland already has more deaths than births. So there are parts of the country where we're already in that negative territory. And long before you get there, you've had a great aging of the population. And what I think is really important, you've had a great slowing of the net inflow into the workforce. So when I started work in the 1980s, there were one and a half to two people in their early 20s joining the workforce for everyone leaving it in their late 60s, say. And now that those two numbers are almost balanced. And that, I think, is why we have, we have an insatiable appetite for labor, which is something we may come back to. I'm skeptical somewhat about the, uh, the rise of the robots. We need people to do all sorts of things. Um, despite all the talk of uh, self-driving cars and artificial intelligence may change in the future. Again, something we might get to discuss. But we do have this huge appetite for labour. And so despite a very sluggish economy, we haven't, our economy is growing very slowly, um, and despite having a million immigrants a year um, and a half a million plus net immigration, we're still short of labour in every sector. And I think that's fundamentally because we're not having that great net inflow into the workforce, which we had back in the 80s, reflecting the 60s baby boom, and which we would be having if people had had two to three children instead of one to two in my generation. We'll get onto a lot of what you just talked about, but, but again, just to step back slightly, can you just explain what has happened to global fertility rates over the last few decades? And you can talk about the West, you can talk about developing yes. countries. So what happened initially was the so-called demographic transition. Um, we start in a period of the, the world that Malthus described, people breeding like rabbits, dying like flies. The average woman had six or seven children. Many would die before the age of one, and not that many would get to breeding age themselves, and so overall the population maybe went up a bit or down a bit. Um, so you could say high fertility, high mortality, low population. As you get modernity, um, this was really the subject of my, my second book, The Human Tide, um, and it happened first in Britain, then it spread across Europe, and then in the 20th century, particularly the latter half, the middle and latter half, spread across the rest of the world. First, your mortality falls. You look after your children better. Your more educated mothers are better at looking after them. You've got a bit more health care. Quite rudimentary things, slightly better water, can massive, you know, it's the 80-20 rule. A, a little bit of better food, better health care causes a massive drop in mortality rates. Population goes up. And then eventually, a more urban, a more educated, more wealthy population has smaller family sizes, and it stabilizes at the higher level. As I say, that started in Britain. You can see that pattern. It was only really described in between the 20s and the 40s as, as a, a theory, but it was really happening in Britain from the very early part of the 19th century. Spread across Europe, spread across the rest of the world. And so if we'd been having this discussion sort of 40, 50 years ago, we would have said it's a Western thing. But of course, East Asia, which has had very, very rapid economic growth, the lives of people in places like Korea and Taiwan have been transformed. And they too have got to very, very low fertility rates, even lower than the European level. Um, and what's happened, two things I think have happened. One is that even countries that are still quite poor have fast forwarded into their demographic future. So a country like India, which is still pretty poor, uh, they're putting their efforts into keeping people alive. And so life expectancy in India, I think I'm right in saying 30, 40 years ago, it was 20 years short of the US, and now it's six or seven years short of the US. So generally, the developing world, although still even the parts that are quite poor, have made very, very fast progress in keeping people alive. But they've also made very, very fast progress, if progress is the world, in bringing down their fertility rates. So you've got a country like India, where the fertility rate is now only just about two, and large parts of India, major states like West Bengal or Kerala, have a fertility rate lower than Britain's. And I've read that Calcutta, 
uh, has a fertility rate of, of one. So it's extraordinary how fast countries are moving through their demographic transition even faster than they're moving through their economic progress. So that's one thing that's happened. Then the other thing that's happening, which I think is interesting, is that once you've been through it, it's not that everyone is, everyone aspires to live long, so most people do. So life expectancy expands and it sort of stabilizes. In Japan, it's mid 70s, the US is, it, sorry, mid 80s in Japan. Um, the US is, is around 79, 80. So it, it varies, but broadly. And it's declining that, in the US. Yes, as well. it has done for reasons we might discuss um, the so called diseases of despair. But broadly, everyone gets to that kind of long life expectancy. And then the question is who's having big families and who's having small families? And that's, I think, very much culturally driven. So the material story is over, if you like. That materially driven urbanization, education, um, rise in income economic development, moving you through the transition. Once you're through it, what matters is what are your values, what's your culture, uh, what's your religion? And so, I mean, it's interesting that a country like Korea, coming back to Korea, has a fertility rate of 0.8. We have a fertility rate twice that. Now, we may think our fertility rate is rather sickly in the UK, and it's below replacement, and it's been low for a long time. I think that has lots of implications. But there are reasons why we have twice the fertility rate of Korea. And there are religious groups in the United States and elsewhere um, who have very high fertility rates, who have six or seven, in a world where- So these are like the Amish? The Amish, uh, the Hutterites, the Haredi Jews. And the result is, of course, they've got sort of um, pre-modern fertility rates, but modern mortality rates. So they live long. And therefore, they have tremendous growth uh, possibilities in terms of numbers. Uh, they're still very small groups. The question, of course, is whether they will um, expand exponentially and for how long. Um, and the effect could be felt. That's probably a long-term issue. Um, Something, on the other hand, the Japanese, as I was saying, if you get to the point, you know, their, their decline has been quite slow, but it's now going to get much faster almost regardless of what they do, because they have so few young women of childbearing age. And I can't see Japan or Korea getting back to a fertility rate of two. So I think once you're through this material process of, of transitioning, you can control your fertility. Uh, you live to at least 75 plus. Then the question is, what are your values? Um, what are your priorities? What are your traditions? And how important is childbearing and rearing uh, compared to other things you could be doing with your time, or indeed ideologies of antinatalism, which we've discussed. Britain is an interesting case example because we've got declining fertility rates, and to top up the population, as you mentioned, we've let in hundreds of thousands, millions of immigrants over a very short period of time, and our demographics have changed in a historic way, again, in an exceptionally short period of time, just a few decades, you can see massive shifts in our demography. What has been the impact of this mass migration on Britain's demography and where do you see that heading in the future? Well, I was uh, once on Radio 4 actually and I was being asked about this and I, I said um, that mass immigration may be a good thing, may be a bad thing, but it is a new thing. A country of historic immigration is a complete myth. Um, and, and surprisingly, that was taken up by the presenter as a rather interesting observation. That was my other question, but anyway, I'm glad yes. you've answered it. Okay, so um, by my estimates, and the data's not fantastic, the immigration between the Norman Conquest and, well, certainly the Second World War was probably less, taking the British Isles as a whole, so we're not talking about from Scotland or Ireland, which was then part of the, much of that part of the United Kingdom. Within the British Isles, I, would, I think it's probably true to say that the immigration from the Norman Conquest to the Second World War was lower, and maybe significantly lower than a year or two's immigration since the late 1990s. So, um, of course, when people come from many different countries, it changes the complexion of the population. We've had massive um, ethno-demographic change in this country. And it's changed the country, and it's changed its population, it's changed its religion, it's changed its food, it's changed its affiliations. Um, and undoubtedly, it has given rise to a response and a reaction. Uh, it's not always welcomed by everybody. 
Um, it's not always welcomed by everybody who is an immigrant. I'm the child of immigrants, as I often say, um, and I think we need immigration and undoubtedly will continue to have it. But I do value the country that I was born into in the 1960s, and I think there is a speed of change which has gone beyond what most people want. Um, and I no doubt, along with Matt Goodwin, so I know you've, you've, you've interviewed him, Eric, Eric Kaufman, who you've also interviewed, they've both done quite serious uh, quantitative work that shows the vote for Brexit, for example, was very much a vote for slower uh, rates of immigration and slower ethnic change in the country. Where I slightly differ from them, though, is I think the demand for labor is so intense that until we are able to reproduce ourselves as a country, as this new Britain, this very multi-ethnic Britain, all our communities, um, until we can all reproduce ourselves effectively, we will continue to have a huge demand for labor. And there will be sectoral shortages, which whack-a-mole style, oh, we've got a problem with the tanker drivers, throw some money at that. Oh, we've got a problem with the doctors, well, we'll bring some in or we'll train some more. But you can't compensate for the fact that each cohort is smaller than the last. Countries like Poland, which were traditional sources of immigration, um, have had huge drops in their fertility rate. There are far, far fewer 20-somethings in Poland now than there were 30 years ago. There'll be far fewer in 30 years' time. So um, the whole complexion of immigration is undoubtedly going to change. And until we are able to reproduce ourselves as a nation, we will inevitably have a requirement for immigration. And I think it's very important to point that out because I think otherwise people see this enormous ethnic change and they get unhappy, some get unhappy, and some start casting around for explanations. And the explanation I would give for many people is what do you demand as in terms of shelf fillers at Tesco or in terms of people to look after your parents in the old age home or in terms of tanker drivers? Think about your demand for labor. And then what have you contributed in terms of how many children have you had? Have you had two or three children, or have you had zero or one? And if the latter, don't be surprised that someone else has to come into the country to do all those jobs you want done. Now, of course, Japan is the alternative to this, where they haven't accepted mass yeah. migration. And maybe you can assess the impact of that yeah. on their society. Because mass immigration does have opportunity costs. It does have um, you know, negatives and, and some presumably some positives as well in terms of culture and food and things. Um, but you know, whether you look at, Ed West wrote a fantastic book about this, the, the diversity illusion, where he goes into all the negative consequences of this massive increase in diversity in this, in this tiny, tiny period of time, and whether that's rates of depression or uh, ethnic, even ethnic conflicts within, within Britain, as we've seen in places like Leicester. Of course, um, you know, you could talk about labor shortages on the one side, and I could say, well, look at all these other issues on the other. Um, so perhaps Perhaps you can assess Japan as, as the sort yeah. of alternative to Britain. Yeah, Japan is an alternative model. I mean, it's very interesting. In Japan, or among the Japanese, the idea that they would want the country to be less ethnically Japanese is it's so obviously the case that they wouldn't, that they don't even discuss it. Whereas here, the idea that we might want the country to be more ethnically homogenous is so unacceptable we can't Well, our slogan it. is diversity is our strength. Is right. So, so the, the thing is not discussable in either country. In Japan, because everybody agrees that uh, they want to keep a, a ethnically as Japanese as possible. And in Britain, in much of the West, because if you were to say such a thing, you would be beyond polite society. So uh, I think that's an interesting observation. Um, we're now even seeing countries like Tunisia, where people are starting to say, our oh, oh, um, ethnicity is changing. We have a fairly low fertility rate. We've got a lot of immigration from areas with a higher fertility. Is it something we want? So I, I do very much strongly believe we should be discussing it and debating it and asking people what they want and in democratic style responding to their desires through policies and through politics. Japan has um, a very low level of immigration, a very high level of homogeneity. It is an orderly society, it is a successful society, but let's not think that Japan is the answer. Um, Japan has had really sluggish economic growth for 30 years, whereas it was, you know, I'm old enough to remember when Japan was the rising sun, um, and then it stopped being the rising sun. It's got really, really old. It is losing population from much of its countryside. Um, its prime minister is talking about civilizational collapse. 
the debt to GDP ratio, so the amount of government money the government's borrowed versus the, the, the GDP, is now over 250% compared to our roughly 100%. So um, it's all very well as long as the markets keep funding that. But you know, Liz Truss found even at 100% it was a bit wobbly. I don't know how long the markets or even the, the Japanese uh, saver is going to go on um, funding uh, the Japanese deficit. And that deficit's driven by pensions payments. It's driven by the fact that a very old population requires a very large expenditure on its health. Um, and it's also driven by the fact that there are fewer and fewer young taxpayers coming through the system. The other thing is Japan has had, like us, 50 plus years of sub-replacement fertility, but it's been lower than ours. And they are now at the point the population's dropping, and that's new, that's fairly new. And the st speed at which it's going to drop is going to accelerate. So I really wouldn't advertise going the Japanese route. Um, I, think, I think it... The, f the opposition to immigration will stumble the first time people find the buses have been cut back because there are no bus drivers or their bins haven't been collected. Um, I may be wrong on this, but you know, of course, the Japanese are also very keen on investing in the kind of technologies that will assist in replacing labour, and that's all wonderful. And you know, we have seen some advance in that. We could invest in that more ourselves. But I do believe that there are huge parts of the economy where human labour will continue to be required. And I'm dubious that within the next 10, 20, even 30 years, some miracle of robots is going to come over the horizon. And Japan's just about held the line, but I don't think technology is going to solve the problem once Japan's population really goes into a tailspin. So I mentioned the recent census data, again showing a decline in white people in Britain uh, from, I think, 86% to about 81%. Mm. And I'm interested to know what Britain will look like in the future. So, if, you know, in the last 70 years, it's changed in a big way. What could it look like in 70 years' time from now? How does fertility rates within different ethnic groups and, and change? Um, and will that sort of stabilise? Because recent immigrants, the idea is that recent immigrants have a higher fertility rate than the native population, but perhaps that will change. So I think... Um, the best estimates is that those who call themselves white British will be a minority by 2060, maybe 2070. Um, of course, a lot of immigration has been white from countries like Poland. I think that will cease. I think if you want to know what the complexion of the country will look like in the future, you know, look at our cities and sort of expand that out. Um, so I think that's fairly uncontroversial. Now, the fertility rate of minority groups, the data's not fantastic, but it's fairly good. We know the following. First of all, that many ethnic groups in this country have a fertility rate more or less at the same level as the country as a whole. Um, for example, Hindus, Sikhs, Afro-Caribbeans do not have particularly large families. The only groups which do have larger families are generally Muslims, whether Bengali, Bangladeshi, uh, Pakistani, or um, Somali, uh, other African Muslims. And in all cases, their fertility rate is not very high. And it's falling rapidly in many of these countries. You know, Pakistan is, has a higher fertility rate than India, but it's falling rapidly at home, as it were. Bangladesh, very rapidly. And the communities in this country will not, I don't think, have a significantly higher fertility rate than the general population for a very long time. It will converge. Um, there will be certain assimilation uh, factors. On the other hand, they do have the demographic momentum that I was talking about. So even if they're the average number of women uh, the number, number of children uh, had by women in these communities is pretty similar or any slightly higher. There are a lot more young women relative to their population than to the white British population. So they've got some inbuilt um, dynamics, some, some, some uh, demographic momentum, which will mean that they will, without immigration, they will expand. I think that would be modest. I mean, if we stopped immigration now, um, the balance of the population would continue to change, but much more slowly, and eventually it would st stabilize. Um, so that, that roughly is what's going on, and it's true of other countries as well. If you look at the Mexicans in the States, or Latinos generally, they had a higher fertility rate. Now it's, it's trivially higher than the uh, average American. Now, the, obviously the major problem with um, declining fertility rates, or one of the major problems, is an aging population. And how do we deal with that? Because, as you say, we have to fund their pensions, we, and we have to look after them, and everything else, and, and someone has to grow the economy and, and earn the money and everything else. So that's, that's the kind of 
the crisis that all these countries are facing. And some people say, well, the, the solution to this in Britain is uh, mass immigration. We can dissolve this, this sort of gap in the workforce by, by Im importing people from other countries. But isn't that just a short-term solution? Because these immigrants themselves will presumably one day grow old and need the same you know, uh, money and sure. pensions and everything else. As oh, I absolutely people. believe that. So, I mean, first of all, politicians will always go for short gap solutions and who can blame them the next elections in five years time three years time one year's time they don't want people screaming about no one to look after mum in the, in the care home or whatever um, so I don't think that the British model is sustainable for two reasons first of all I think uh, it's just unacceptable for many people in this country to have ever ongoing rapid ethnic change Secondly, it is a bit of a Ponzi scheme, partly because the countries from which many of the immigrants are coming just aren't producing that excess population that they did, such as Poland. And secondly, exactly as you say, their fertility rate falls, they get old, and they need to be looked after as well. So I don't think in the long term the immigration model works. Um, neither do I believe in the long term, as I've already said, that the Japanese model works, because they've just about held the line with a lot of government debt, and a lot of moving their manufacturing to China, and a lot of technology, but I just don't think it's going to be able to substitute when the population really starts falling. So I do think that the only solution, the only model that does work is one where, heaven forfend, people have on average two to three children. I'm not preaching. Um, <laughs> I mean, I had three myself. I'm very happy with that. And, uh, you know, I think that's a nice number of children to have. Some people don't want children. Some people want bigger families. But that a, com that a community or a society should on average be able to have two to three children doesn't seem to me an extraordinary uh, suggestion. Um, but it's, unfortunately, it's a very long way from where we are. We seem to be heading in the other direction. And it's very hard to find an example of a developed country where the fertility rate is not substantially below the replacement level. And if it hasn't been there for a long time, that's because they've only developed relatively recently, like the countries in East Asia. Um, the, the, mo the only ex ex exception being Israel as a developed country with um, three children per woman. Um, I, I can't see a sustainable model in the long term that does not involve a significant rise in the fertility rate. The question, of course, is how we get there. And we're getting back to that first question I asked about taboos. And yes. I think this is an odd taboo that to say that to increase fertility is a, a, a good policy is, you know, f for the reasons that we mentioned earlier about cli climate change being one of them and other um, you know, these, uh, these ideas of the population bomb of the fa mass famines and everything else that goes back a long time. Yeah. Um, but it's not only that. So when governments try to um, increase fertility, people have these ideas of dictators handing out medals to mothers and um, this authoritarian... Handmaiden's tale. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly, Margaret Atwood. And, um, and of course, when they might look at Hungary. And when you go to Budapest and you get off the plane, you see these fantastic <laughs> signs of, of uh, families and these posters, and they say this is a far-right authoritarian yeah. um, uh, policy. How do we overcome this, I don't know, the stereotype of, 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 of increasing fertility? Well, I think you're right. There are some specific issues which we already talked about environmentalism. I think there's a really actually quite nasty antinatalism at work in the world, which we have to address. Um, but then when you talk about pronatalism... And just, sorry, just, yeah. uh, just on that, is, does mm -hmm. that just come from the left? I mean, do you, or is it significantly coming from the sort of political left, do you think? Well, it, it's not coming from the traditional left. It's not coming from the, I mean... You the know, new left, the it's, woke it's, left. It's a new, you know, I, I'm not a, um, an expert on the left, mm. but there are people on the left who are, very, you know, there are people on the left who don't like this at all. And certainly under certain uh, left-wing leaders. The trouble with the left is their idols from previous generations are soon uh, bogeyman. So, you know, if we'd been having this conversation in the 40s, I'd have said, well, Comrade Stalin believes in large families. And if we'd been having it in the 1960s, I'd say, oh, Comrade Mao believes in large And they both did. I mean, Stalin gave medals for large families, uh, made abortion much harder. Um, Mao was always pronatalist. And it's interesting that he um, only, only sort of after the, the Gang of Four had been, he died, the Gang of Four had been purged. It took a while for the, the um, and for the one-child policy to come to the fore in, in China. So, um, you know, 
Castro had pronatal policies. So you've kind of got to be careful with the left wingers mm. to find who their idols are. But now they think it's Hitler who was the pronatalist. That's how right, the, that's well, I mean, horribly, Hitler killed a lot of people. So I don't see that as being particularly pronatal, as did Mao and Mao and uh, Stalin. Stalin. But but you know, lots of uh, authoritarians are of left and right are pronatal. Um, so that kind of gets us onto the second thing of how forgetting the the anti the nasty antinatalism. How do you um, promote pronatalism without falling into that camp. Now, I think it's kind of down to us, isn't it? It's kind of down to people like me. Um, you know, maybe just the very fact that I'm saying I believe families should be two to three on average, it would probably be very good for society, that we're suffering from the fact that they haven't been that size for a couple of generations. Um, you know, that might inherently make me beyond the pale. Um, and I wrote an article for the Sunday Times, which gave rise to a debate, which I welcome. And I'm hoping to write a book on the subject. And we'll see now. If you, if you are, there was a big storm about this article. Yes, right? there was. There was a bit of a Twitter storm. But I'm not on Twitter, so I was largely <laughs> oblivious to it. Um, but I did get some invites. To, you know, the, and what I say about that is, I got, I did not get no platform. So I stuck my head above the parapet, and I got a chance to go on Radio Two, Radio Four, lots of local BBC radios, GB. I mean, lots of. I had lots of platforms. So I don't think it's so beyond the pale that when you say it, you get shut down. Actually, things have opened up. So I think we need to be a bit more courageous. And you know, I do think that if we leave that, it's up to us whether we leave pronatalism, which I think is so necessary and which is pro-life and which not not in the anti-abortion sense, but just life is human life is a good thing and aren't babies wonderful and aren't people fascinating of their different cultures, their different genders, two, maybe more than two, we can debate that. In all their complexity and variety and, and genius, that human life is a good thing. I think if you say, well, anyone who believes that is a right-wing nutter who needs to be shut up. Um, it, you know, that's, that's terrible and it's incumbent on people who aren't right-wing nutters or left-wing nutters to take a stance and not allow that bit of the political field to be taken over by the extremists. I think we do need to have a debate about it, we do need to talk about it as a country, as a society and as a community and we need to make sure it's not left to the extremists because it's so important for the human future that if we do leave it to the extremists we are giving them um, a, a great advantage. What impacts fertility? Well, very good question and very complex answer. So if you go back to what I was saying about the demographic transition, <coughs> time was that it was very much dominated by material progress. You know, if you look back in 1970, for example, and I've, I've done this work, um, cor if you correlate GDP per capita, and fertility rates, or urbanization and fertility rates. You've got a very close fit. The, the richer the country, the more urbanized and the more educated, take a literacy rate, you know, all basic correlations of uh, high fertility were low development and high development. And th that was what happened. And you moved from six to two, that's broadly. So these material things matter a lot. Um, and it's still the case that more educated people have smaller families. More urban people in most of the world have smaller families. Um, and richer people have smaller families. But what's happening, if you now look at the rich world, so if you ignore the countries that are still going through that process, and you look at the rich world, that correlation has broken down. Why do people in Greece have 1.2 or 1.3 children, and people in Sweden 1.7 or 1.8? It's not any more about material progress. So what is it about? Well, partly government policy can help, although I'm skeptical that it can do all that much. I think it is about, a cult, as I've said already, a culture, tradition, um, norms, uh, things that governments can only influence peripherally. Um, I don't think it's a material thing anymore. So, for example, we say, well, you know, if, if we could help people with childcare, if we'd help with housing, I think these are very important things. They, housing and healthcare uh, and childcare are very expensive in Britain, and no doubt they are um, encouraging people to have smaller families or no families at all. And yet, it can't be the case that today we can't afford children when s much poorer societies in other parts of the world, and our own society, when it was fantastically poorer, 
had far more children. So I think we've got to think about our priorities as a country. And also in Sweden and Norway, where they've got the most uh, help for those things like childcare costs yeah. and housing, etc. And they have got better fertility rates. They're not fantastic. I mean, they've been a bit above ours for a long time, and I think, but they're also heading downward. So I think the other thing to do is we've got to confront head on the uh, pernicious ideology of antinatalism in all its, its forms. And I do think that we have to invent a feminism which is pronatal a multiculturalism which is pronatal, and an environmentalism which is pronatal. There's no reason why feminism shouldn't embrace people having children. Yes, men should play their role. Yes, the state needs to help out in certain ways. Uh, companies have got certain obligations. But why should feminism be antenatal? Why should feminists not be outraged that so many fetuses were aborted in China because they were women? You know, it's interesting what, what does and doesn't provoke classical feminists. So I think all, I don't want to push back against any of these things. I have two daughters and a son. My daughters had fantastic educational opportunities. They have fantastic career opportunities. I don't want them back in the kitchen. I want them making their contribution to the world. We need the women making contribution to the world just as much as we need men. We need to find a way that we can combine that with uh, all of us playing our role in helping families grow and not allow feminism to be taken over by antenatal uh, ideal, ideal, ideologues. When you talk about Greece having 1.2 mm. and uh, Sweden having 1.6, mm. how significant is that difference? Is that, a, is that statistically It is very significant, significant because you've kind of got to think about it not like, oh, it's a bit higher in Sweden. It's like how much short of two, let's call it two for the sake of an argument. If you're at 1.9 or 1.8, you're not that far away from two. If you're at 1.2 or 1.3, you will be, your population will fall much more quickly. And I think a lot of the question in the future is gonna be how fast can technology substitute for falling populations? And if the falling populations are very fast, I don't think the robots will fill the gap. Whereas if, you know, at 1.8 or 1.9 over a long period of time with a rising productivity and more educated people, I think you can hold the line. I think when it gets down to that low, the potential for population decline is so rapid that you could have what the Japanese, Japanese Prime Minister is talking about, or Elon Musk is talking about, civilizational collapse at the level of countries or communities. Um, it's, not, it's, not just, you, it's not just, oh, it's a bit higher, it's 0.3 or 4 or 5 higher. It, it's a fraction of the gap. It's a fraction lower than the, the replacement level, rather than, you know, somewhere like Greece might be three or four times uh, a, a bigger gap between what they're experiencing and replacement levels. I think you have to have to think about it that way. Have some countries managed to increase fertility rates in in any significant way? The jury's still out a bit on Hungary and Russia. We know they've got very pronatal policies, which is a bit embarrassing because, of course, you know we associate pronatalism with those regimes. They had a bit of an uptick. Um, there can be an uptick when women stop delaying pregnancy. So what happens is various cohorts delay. They have them later, they have the children later, and that tends to depress total fertility. But if you look at the cohort as a whole at the end, it's not actually had fewer children because it's had more later. So when you go through that dip, you come out the other, and I think oh, that's a lot of what's been happening. in. So what did they do, Hungary and Russia? Well, they've had pronatal policies. They give people money when they have children. They give them tax breaks. I mean, different things, a whole array, but largely financial incentives to have children. Georgia, interestingly, did seem to manage to buck the trend with um, an appeal from the church. Again, it's a bit early to see whether that's sustainable. Um, you know, how not to do it. Romania in the 1960s, Ceausescu suddenly decided he wanted a big population. <coughs> so he more or less banned abortion and contraception overnight. And the, and the fertility rate did go up very rapidly. And then it fell very rapidly when people figured out ways around the system. And another result of that was all those orphans, tragically, in, in neglected, uh, neglected in, in orphanages. So um, that's how not to do it. And of course, Israel has got a fertility rate of three. It did go um, down to about 2.5 in the 90s. And what happened in Israel is the European origin Ashkenazi population always had a low fertility rate, even from the days of the 20s and 30s. And then in came people from Iraq, Jewish refugees from Iraq, kicked out of Egypt, Morocco, and so on. And they had a much higher fertility rate, and rapidly their fertility rate dropped towards the Ashkenazi norm, 
as those societies were incorporated, educated, and so on. And the thing sort of evened off at about two and a half in the 90s. And then it did go up to three. Now, I think in the case of Israel, the government's quite pro-natal. It certainly um, subsidizes IVF. I mean, it's the world IVF le leader. It's not massively generous. So I think it's a cultural thing. And I think in the case of Israel, it's partly a sense of being surrounded by enemies, being in some kind of uh, competition for uh, majority status in, in, the, in the area, whether defined as Israel within the pre-67 or, or post-67 borders. Um, you know, I, th I think there's that sort of ethnic conflict element, which in certain circumstances, as a subject of my first book, in certain circumstances can give rise to a higher fertility rate. But it's also just a, an inherent pronatalism in the culture, where that comes from, how it can be manufactured is another question. Of course, there is an ultra-orthodox, super-religious element who do have very large families, but at the moment, they will be a bigger and bigger part of the country. At the moment, there's still only 12 or 13% of the population. So that alone does not explain why they have three children per woman and the rest of the OECD has two or below. Let's talk about China, one of the most fascinating case studies. Yeah. Obviously, their famous one-child policy mm. must have had a huge impact on their fertility rates. Why did they end that policy relatively recently? Well, first of all, I would say infamous, not famous. Secondly, I don't think it had that much effect, surprisingly. So it's very cruel at an individual level. Um, but if you look at China in the 70s, the fertility rate fell from 6 or 7 to 3. So it was on an incredibly sharp downward trajectory for all the reasons we've discussed, the development, the urbanization. Primitive early days in the 70s, but still enough to cause a fall in fertility rates. And when you think how fast China developed in the 80s and 90s, that was bound to continue. <coughs> and indeed, if you look at Chinese communities in places like Taiwan, Malaysia, or indeed non-Chinese communities in East Asia, they were all on this very fast trajectory. So I think it, it did make a contribution to, to the fall in Chinese fertility rates. But I think it, they would have fallen pretty fast had it not been for that policy. Um, where it's left the government, though, is looking pretty stupid now. Um, the population is falling earlier than people expected. The workforce is falling. So if you think Chinese economic growth has been built on, as Soviet economic growth was, more productive labor, taking people from field to factory with a basic literacy and so on, I mean, that makes a difference. But just a, a growth in the workforce as well. Now that's ended, your your economic growth is dragged down every year by the, po by the fall in the working age population. And China's going to have a rapidly declining uh, workforce. It's going to have a huge old age population. It's going to have a very bad dependency ratio. Um, and it's very hard for the, for the Communist Party now. I mean, it's trying, but it's kind of got egg on its face. It's an about turn. It's very hard to encourage um, uh, pronatal policies when you've been haranguing people and bullying them uh, in the other direction for so long. So I think the demography of China is, is in a very bad way. It would be in a bad way even without the one-child policy, but that has just compounded the problem. Will they get old before they get rich? Well, they're kind of not poor anymore. I mean, they have got um, significantly better off. But I think I can see Chinese growth falling year in, year out. It's still a low-end, medium-income country. So yes, I think they're already getting old. I think the median age in China is either about to surpass or has already surpassed the US's. Um, and this is what happens when I said, when you, when you get a country where they adopt the characteristics of an advanced country in terms of low fertility earlier in terms of their economic progress. And you can see in countries like Thailand, Thailand's got very low fertility rate and is still quite poor. Um, th these countries will get um, old before they get rich. And whether they're, I mean, what the difference in China is they won't be able to import people to look after their old people. A, because they don't have a high enough income um, uh, to attract people, they couldn't pay enough on the world market, and B, because a country the size of China would have to be hoovering up whole populations <laughs> in order to do that. So I think the outlook for China is bad. I think the outlook for the elderly in China is particularly bad. I wouldn't want to be an old person in China in 10, 20, or 30 years' time. Africa. Now, we haven't mentioned Africa mm. much, but they've still got high fertility rates, and in some countries, it's still increasing, right? Yeah. So what does the f future of Africa look like? Well. You have to 
distinguish between different regions. So north of the Sahara, the fertility rate is not very high. Um, Again, Morocco is a great case of a country where, I say great, it's a very good example of a country where pretty low levels of socioeconomic development, low levels of female fertility, and they were still getting sub three uh, children. Uh, even Egypt, which has gone up and down a bit, it's not gone much above three and it's probably sub three at the moment. So north, north of the Sahara, there's still some demographic momentum, but the population will stabilize. South Africa and its neighbors have also been very successful in bringing their fertility rate down. The fertility rate in South Africa and most of its neighbors is in the sort of two to three range. Um, some countries in East Africa have been very successful. Big countries like Kenya and Ethiopia have been very successful in bringing their fertility rates down, say, from six towards three, four to three to four. Um, but again, lots of demographic momentum, those big cohorts of young women, even if they're having fewer children per woman. So a lot of growth there still. But you can see a stabilization. There are some countries in West Africa, particularly Nigeria, where the fertility rate remains very high. There is actually a debate going on among demographers about how fast it's falling, and some people think it's falling very fast, others think it's not. Um, the data's not fantastic. Um, countries like Nigeria, women's education is still very poor, a lot are illiterate, and yet there is some evidence of that starting to change. It almost doesn't matter in terms of the perspective of the next 20, 30, 40 years. Africa, regardless, because of demographic momentum, is going to become the big global demographic player. So it will have gone from about 7% of the world's population circa 1950 to about 37% of the world's population circa 2100. Um, and and that, is that because of time lag? So basically we, won't, we, we don't see the impact of fertility rates until sort of a generation? Well, they had high fertility but high mortality. So they've only, it's only as, as infant mortality rates tumbled since the 90s that a lot of these countries, the more backward countries, the poorer countries like Sierra Leone, say, um, they've ha historically had high fertility but high mortality. So what's really happened in Africa is not a rise in fertility rates. Fertility rates have always been high. The mortality rates have fallen, particularly infant mortality, life expectancy is extended. And that's what's driving the population growth. Now, what does that mean for the world? I think a world that is 37% as opposed to 7% African, African must be different in terms of power politics, culture, food. Um, entertainment, uh, geostrategy, it will be a very different world. Very hard to say how it will be different. I suspect that some countries will be very successful and will figure out how to use a demographic dividend, which is when they get to the point they've got lots of young workers in their 20s who are not having huge families themselves, so the thing starts to slow, the dependency ratio is very low, lots of workers, not that many kids, not that many old people for historic reasons, the population pyramid. That's the um, Goldilocks scenario, if you like, for economic growth. And some countries in Africa will be very successful in riding that, like Indonesia has been, for example. But other countries like Syria, which also should be in that place, or should have been, had it not lost a quarter of its population and displaced another quarter. So I think my point is that the demography can give you opportunities, but it determines nothing. And you can still make an awful hash of things, even when your demography is quite favorable. Um, you know, Africa is a country, a, a continent of many countries, of 50 plus countries, and I think we can already see the outlines of, of some being the stars of the future and some being the basket cases of the future. And just to end the interview, I want to talk about Ukraine very briefly. So the war in Ukraine presumably is having an impact on fertility and demography. Obviously a lot of young men are dying and lots of women have left the country and gone to Poland and gone all over Europe. So I don't know how much research you've done into this or how much you know about this, but maybe you can talk a little bit about the impact of that war on Ukraine and on Russia. Well, my last book came out, um, Tomorrow's People came out just at the time the Ukraine war uh, uh, broke out. And one of the chapters talks about how it's relatively unlikely that older countries with older populations would go to war with each other. And then, of course, these two countries, which have relatively old, not very old population, because life expectancy is not very long in Russia or Ukraine. Um, both countries have very similar demographic uh, situations. They both got le long periods of low fertility rates. Um, Russia <coughs> experienced quite a lot of immigration after the Soviet period, initially of Russians who had moved to the so-called near abroad, moving back from places like Kazakhstan, the Baltics, um, and also pe people from Chechnya and, and, and um, 
the Caucasus. So people who weren't ethnically Russian have also flocked to Russia. So that's sort of helped Russia. But Russia's also now got a falling, po before the war had a falling population, an aging population, a uh, limit to the number of young men. And of course the war has just made this terribly worse. Um, it's impossible for me to say how it will, uh, how it will, will pan out. Or, I mean, the key thing for Ukraine is are the refugees who come west going to go back to Ukraine to rebuild it? Or having found comfortable homes in Britain, Poland, and elsewhere, are they going to stay? Um, Russia and Ukraine, however, whatever happens in terms of the um, refugees going home or at least stopping leaving Russia, a lot of young men have left Russia, as you know, uh, to escape the draft and so on. Whatever happens, these are societies that have very low fertility and that have had very low fertility for a very long time. And the war has only made this worse, but they've got some fundamental demographic problems. And um, for example, in, east, in the east of Russia, in Siberia, tiny communities, small communities have become tiny communities, villages have died out. It's very hard to get the get, keep the elect electricity supply running in parts of eastern Russia, the transport running. So you will have these areas largely abandoned, huge areas abandoned to the wolves, buildings will collapse. Now, that kind of has a, a security issue for Russia, I suppose. Um, th there is this sense of a shriveling and people moving inward to a, a core, uh, to the big cities, um, and the abandonment of large areas of the countryside and continuing aging. Um, so they both got very profound demographic problems to start with. Uh, the war has made them worse. Some of that may be reversed uh, by the end of the war, which we hope for um, soon. But regardless of that, until these countries fix their super low fertility rates, which Putin's tried to do, not necessarily with great success. Uh, again, he's aware of the problem, he's talked about the problem, and therefore discredits pronatalists, unfortunately. Uh, hence the need for more sensible and moderate voices. Um, but until they fix those fundamental problems, uh, their future is going to be pretty bleak. Thank you very much, Paul, for joining us. Thank you.